you, Lord, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, just praise him one more time. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, my Savior, my Savior. Oh, the one who loves me. Hallelujah. I trust you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, we sang another song earlier on, The Joy of the Lord is My Strength. And I would just want to thank you again to worship. It's just beautiful this morning to be in the presence of the Lord and worshiping together. But the joy of the Lord. The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And the joy is you. And it's a revelation that because you bring so much joy to the Lord, it should give you strength. That's what he means about. That's what it means. Because he has so much joy in you. And if you get a revelation of how much he joys over you, it will give you strength. It will give, that's what the joy of the Lord is. That gives you strength. Lord, give us a revelation of how loved we are. How loved that we are this morning in the beloved. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, worship teams. Please be seated. Good morning to you all. And it's so, it's so endearing for me and Catherine to be here at the church. We, we love you, Springs Church. It's a great honor to be here to preach the word of God. We so love your pastor and his wife, Sarah. Uh, what a fine man of God uh, your husband is, Sarah. Isn't he a wonderful man, Pastor Owen? Thank God for him. Wonderful man of God. And uh, all, all your ministers here, every one of them are just the great, great men of God. And thank God for your brothers. And Brother Rob, thank you for leading the missions trip this year to Ireland. You did a far better job than Pastor Matt the year before. <laughs> just want to tell you that. That wouldn't be hard, mind you. But <laughs> and thank you to all the team that came over to minister to the Irish. You did a fantastic job. No expense spared. You even hired Johnny Depp to be the pirate. That was really <laughs> awesome. And uh, they're still talking about uh, the impact you've made on our children. Your min children's ministry here is par excellence. It really is. And we're inspired by your dedication and the attitude that you do in ministry here, you do it with excellence and you do it for the Lord. And when you send the missions team out, you can see it in the young people. They, they, they just kick into another gear. And that's because the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. That's why, because I mean mentored in the right things and the right balances are here at this church. And I thank God for that. I thank God to see a generation of young people oh, dancing in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> I bring you greetings, of course, from my wife, Catherine, and myself and our church in Ireland uh, that we're very akin to. You know a lot about us. I'm not going to go into it right now because I know we've got baptisms, so I've got a word to bring. But again, just to get a, a very, very warm extension of the love from the brothers and sisters in Ireland to you and our, our appreciation to you for not forgetting us and for supporting the work in Ireland. We thank you very much for twinning or partnering with us for, for so many years. You, you are a tremendous blessing. This church, if you're new to the Springs Church, I just want you to just, just have a good look around, see what God is doing here because this church punches above its weight, not just locally, but nationally and internationally. And uh, thank God for the vision that's here. Amen. And for the fruit of that vision, which is young people on fire for God. <laughs> Praise God indeed. So if you have your Bible turned uh, to the book of Joshua this morning, we're going to read a very well-known portion of scripture for you Bible readers. We're going to, the title of my message is The Battle for Fellowship. That's the title this morning, The Battle for Fellowship. And uh, I brought my small print this morning, which is always a bad mistake for guys that are now wearing glasses and the arms are not long enough. So, <laughs> reading from verse 6. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him, and it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt but I wholly followed the Lord my God. Now, if you're reading a New Living Translation, it would say, I wholeheartedly 
followed the word of the Lord. So Moses swore that that day, surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever because you have wholly followed the Lord your God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. And he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85 years old, yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now therefore give me the mountain uh, of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in the day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as the inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenzanite, the Kenzanite, to this day because he wholly or wholeheartedly followed the Lord God of Israel. Amen. My gosh, give us more Caleb's. That's all I can say. 85 years old. It's an interesting part of the scripture because this is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. You remember, remember the story of Abraham. God calls a man. Out of that man, he gives him a people. Out of that people, he makes them into a nation. Out of that nation, he gives them a homeland. And out of that homeland will come the savior of the world. That's the plan. And here we have the subduing of that land, the promises of God. And you have great picture types. When you read your Bible, it's, everything is mimetic or embryonic of the, the greater story of salvation. It's all there. It's all there in the names. It's all there. There are shadows and types. The, the, the scriptures, the Bible is the most brilliant book you can read. It's consistent. It's deep. It's not just about an actual historical event, but it speaks of different stories. And ultimately, when you're reading your Bible correctly, you'll always be looking for Christ in the midst of it. Because it's, the Bible says, you know, the whole, I'm revealed in the volume of the book. For it is written of me. The whole book is, this, not me. The whole book is written of Christ. Amen. I'm just testing one, two, testing. Uh, but you're setting me up this morning. So praise God. This, this is an incredible story. So you have a picture type here. You have a picture of Joshua. And his name in Hebrew is exactly the same name as Jesus. It means deliverer. Joshua and Jesus is the same name. It's the same Hebrew name. And you have Caleb. And it's an interesting thing because Caleb wasn't a Jew. Caleb was a Kenzanite uh, that attached himself to, to Judah. They married, probably married into the royal tribe of Judah. And so he was a proselyte or a conversion, a, con a convert to Judaism or to the Hebrew people. And so you have this picture of the Jew and the Gentile going into the promised land together. You, you see this incredible, because in Christ is not a Jew nor Gentile, male or female, all are one in Christ. And there's this great this picture of unity going in. He, he's, the Bible says he, he is of a different spirit. You have to be at 85 and you're, you're wanting to go up a mountain and fight an enemy. I mean, fair enough if you want to fight, but you know, fight on the plains or fight somewhere easy. But you're going for the, the highest terrain. You're going for something that, that is very, very difficult to go militarily. You know, some, a lot of you guys have done military service. The last thing you want to do is attack a stronghold that has a higher elevation than you because all its trajectories, all of its ordinances is aimed down below. You're fighting step by step uphill. And this was no ordinary battle as we see in a few minutes he had a different spirit he was a man of vision he was a man of faith back in numbers 13 when the children of Israel were about six or seven weeks free and moving on they were on the edge really of of the of, of Canaan and Moses sent in 12 spies well two of them were Caleb and Joshua and the other 10 were from the different tribes of Israel and they crossed in and of course, 10 came back and gave a bad report, but Joshua and Caleb gave a report. They were, they were men of faith. We can do it. Oh, the others said, oh, there's giants in that land. Oh, they're too great. The people are too great. And, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't believe that this land was given by God. And if God says it's your land, you just need to say amen and take it. Amen. You know, there's no more talk about it. It's yours. It's been paid for, given to you. It's your, it's your inheritance. And so he's a man of vision, a man of faith. 
you know, and he, he, he had to persevere for 40 years because of the nonsense of these 10 others. You know, it's unbelievable. It's, 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 it's an awful indictment on, on our general churches in America and around the world that so many can be so carnal in our assemblies. You know, you can have the 10 that have every reason why you can't apprehend the things of God. They, 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 they sit down like a calculus. You know, they run the church on the, the best of a natural thinking. Well, we're not educated enough yet. We don't have enough money in the account. Well, we can't do that. Oh, that would be socially odious. I don't know if that's a good strategy. I don't know if the time is right. And, you know, that seems to always be the, 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 the prevailing die that's cast into much of our churches. But we are at an hour today, friends, where I think that God is doing something really wonderful because our backs are to the wall and there's people coming out of the thousands now saying, no, I want to go with God. There's a vision for my life. There's a reason why I exist. There's a fight for me to get involved in. You see so many today with the, the Z generation and the millennials before them. You know, others, my generation, look at them and think that they don't have a lot to offer. But that's unbelief because God has a plan for their lives. Amen. You know, they might be confused, but there's a generation, you saw some of them this morning, that are pulling out of the, the ditches and the margins and begin to follow wholeheartedly after the Lord. What a, that should encourage you in itself, that God is stirring the hearts of young men and women, raising them up into ministry, and they're the ones coming into the church saying, give us the hill country. Give us something bigger than just sweeping the foyer. Let us do something for the Lord. But it can be like those 10 in the corners. Well, you're not old enough yet. You don't have enough Bible in you. You know, your, 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 your dress is just a little bit off or out. Oh, I want to tell you, don't let anything despise your youth. Amen. amen. God put something in you. You better go for it. Amen. Don't be held out in the wilderness for 40 years because of the unbelieving spirit of others. Go for what God has called you to be. He was a man of faith, persevered such negativity. Terrible to deal with negativity in the body. You know, if you are around people that are a negative spirit, Always find a reason why you can't. I want to tell you, find new company. Amen. Because they're going to die in that spirit. They're going to die in that wilderness. But he was a different man. He was a man that endured this and he had to persevere. And thank God today that same spirit of perseverance is here in this church to move into something far greater that the Lord has for our lives, for his testimony, and to see an absolute victory for Calvary in this late, dark hour of the church. You can only really persevere by hearing the voice of God, friends. That's all you can. You can't just persevere in an emotional moment. You have to hear from him. You have to see things the way God sees it. But he was a man of encouragement. He spread a good report. We can do it. God is with us. He was a man of loyalty. He stayed with the project regardless of the unbelief of others. He supported Moses and Joshua. He followed the Lord with a whole heart, a full heart. And at 85 years of age, I want to think of, is anyone here 85? Anyone here above 80 this morning? Give me a small wave. It ain't over yet. <laughs> I'm telling you, it ain't over yet. My mom is turning 80 this year, and she's the number one soul winner in our church. I'm not, and she's, she leads more people to Christ than all our outreach teams put together. Unbelievable. It ain't over yet for you, sister, brother, whoever you are today. You have to have a different spirit. It, he had a wholeheartedness for God. He was after the things of God. And he comes to Joshua all these years later. They're on the, they're on the edge of, of, of moving into the lands, taking the land for God. This is going to be the plan of salvation. Christ is going to come into that land at a future moment in history and, and buy us salvation. And so he looks for the hill country. You know... Who wants to go uphill? Amen. I'll tell you a funny story. It was in holidays a few years ago. And uh, my son and daughter-in-law were with us. And they said, let's go cycling. Oh, no, look at me. Do I look like I'm a cyclist? <laughs> so they said, it's okay, Dad, we'll get you an e-bike. Have you heard of an e-bike? Uh, you're Americans. You don't even have bikes. It's all SUVs and stuff. <laughs> They're things with two wheels and there's a bit of a motor on it, okay? <laughs> run by a battery. So I said, that sounds good to me. So they, uh, they hired me an e-bike. And uh, this, you know, so I'm delighted. So I'm psychologically, I'm up for the cycle. We cycle about 20 miles and I'm tearing into it. I'm 
getting up here. My son is just about ahead of me. I'm staying right on his back or right behind him, following him. And eventually we get there, sweat's pouring off me, and we stop and get off the bike, and only to find out that I never switched on the battery. Yeah, it's a true story. Well, I switched it on for the way back. And I'm telling you, I got there. I was waiting there, sitting, having my coffee when they all arrive around the corner 15 minutes later, you know, with my battery. He wanted the hill country. Now, the, uh, the Anakim lived there, the sons of Anak. The Moabites called them the Emim, the terrors the horrible ones. Others called them the Rephahim, the shady ones or the ghostly ones, the shadowy ones. The mysterious ones is another name they were called. So, some other uh, groups of people called them the Zanzumans, those who speak gibberish. They were described as terrible giants. One, his name was Og. He had a, a bed that was six foot wide and 12 and a half feet long. This was the sort of territory that Caleb was going up against. He was going up against a, a terrifying group of people, mountain group, a wild group, demonically. A lot of these cultures back then, as with the Canaanites, the Canaanites, they were very demonically inspired. Their behaviors were very brutal, very vicious people to, to come up against, very vicious foes, and yet he wanted to go up the mountain. It's interesting, the mountain was known as Hebron. And Hebron means fellowship. When you go down to the root of the word, he wanted to go up, fight through whatever he had to fight, because I believe that he wanted fellowship with God. You know, there's a fight to have fellowship. I'm telling you, there is a fight. It's a good fight, but it's a fight. To be a Christian is not an easy route. It's not a soft cell group of people. To be a Christian, you have to be a fighter. You're, you're called a laborer. You're called a soldier. You know, we don't fight with these. We have to. I'm Irish. I'll fight with them too. But we fight a different way. But we fight nonetheless. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers in the dark places. This whole world, friend, you think it's a political problem? You, 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 you need your eyes opened. You could change the politics of the White House or any house, and it won't change the spiritual climate. It's a spiritual war, friends. We're up against darkness like we've never known before. Antinomianism, the man of lawlessness, has already been released into this world. That spirit of antichrist is everywhere. That confusion of darkness is everywhere. All we're listening to on the television and on the radio is gibberish. Amen. Ghostly voices spewing out their horrid doctrines, their horrid un under the belief systems. And that's what we have to fight, friends. That's what we go up against. Our foes are neither weak nor few. But I want to tell you this, this morning that greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. <laughs> Hallelujah. God has a plan. God has an army. God has got a church. And he's looking for men. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord go to and fro the earth to see whose heart is completely his. He had a wholehearted man with Caleb. He was 85 years old, but he was as strong now as he was back then. And he didn't look for an easy route. He said, give me that hill country. Give me fellowship. Uh, what is real in the, in, the, in the natural is also corresponding into the spiritual, friends. I know you're not inept or dull-minded people. You can convert what this means in the spiritual straight away. You should be doing the math as I speak to you because God is raising up Caleb's spirited people and there is a mountain for fellowship to, for us to climb. There is enemies for us to confront. He Hebron was 3,000 feet above sea level, heavily fortified. But it was where Abraham made the covenant with God. It's where Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac were all buried. There was something in Caleb who says, I want to have fellowship with God, and I don't care what gets in the way. That's where the covenant was made. That's where the promises of God are. And no sacrifice for me is going to be big enough for me to apprehend what God wants me to apprehend. Hallelujah. He wanted what was higher. He had a different spirit, enduring all that negativity. As I said, I've listened to negativity all my life, why you can't do it, why you shouldn't do it. And now I've watched the same people die in the wilderness. I've seen not just them die in the wilderness, I've seen their own children die in the wilderness. I've seen them arguing others out of the good fight because they won't pray, they argue out of prayer. They don't fast, why you don't need to fast. 
Uh, that's legalism. Oh, I want to tell you, friends, if God calls you to fast, it's a disobedient thing not to. Amen. Amen. And when you hear a pastor come and say, we as a church are fasting, that's your spiritual headship. That's your spiritual authority in your life. None of us are islands. We come under authority. Can I hear an amen? amen. We, we don't elect ourselves. I'm not an elected, self-elected person. God put his hand upon me. God elected me to preach the gospel. God elected your pastors to be men and women of God. And that's your spiritual covering. And they say, when they say, we are going to pray and fast, that is not an optional extra. That's my own opinion. You can shoot me afterwards for all I care. I'm gone out of here in half an hour. But when you walk under authority as a Christian, you ain't going to die in the fight, let me tell you. It's those who talk their way out. It's those who wrangle out, those, those 10. You know, those 10, those, those watery 10. There's always 10 to 2 in the church. I pray the odds will start changing here. I pray it will not be just a few that are pursuing and entering the plans and purposes of God, but it will be the majority. And when we have the majority, we will have revival. And when we have revival, there's going to be hope for the nation. And when there's hope for the nations, the host for the nation, there's hope for the nations. Amen. And this is God's plan for us to have fellowship with Him, friends, to push deeper into Him. It's more than just a youth week camp. It's more, God has more for you. Don't settle for the youth week camp. You know, thank God for Him, but there's more. There's more. Did Caleb knew it. Caleb, there's more. I'm, I, these wasters here have just missed the plan of God, and I'm eager to get going. And so he says to the Lord, give me the hill country. Give me where the dark forces are. I want to plunder hell and populate heaven. This was the heart of this man. We wrestle not, Paul tells us, in Ephesians 6, against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. He also tells us this, that one thing I do, I forget what lies behind, and I press on and upward to the high calling. I want to tell you there's a high calling, there's a higher calling for you and for me, church. And it's not just a, a momentary thing, it's a life that God calls us to. Caleb was wholehearted. He was loyal. He had to battle fear. He had to battle evil enemies. He had to battle other people's unbelief. He had to battle to have fellowship with God. Now, people get quiet because they say, that doesn't sound very, that sounds a little bit strifey. That doesn't sound too new covenant. I want to tell you, friends, you have to battle to open your Bible. You have to fight to open your Bible. I was telling the previous congregation, I, I left school at 15. I'm not academic, and reading is not something that comes easy for me. And yet I have to read. I'm a minister, so I mean, talk about the wrong fit for the wrong job. Here you have it. Okay, all nine yards. Out of a, out of a school of 700 people, me and three other candidates were elected as special forces to be part of Mrs. Ruddle's English class. But it wasn't for our brilliance in English. We were the dunces of the school. That was before anybody understood what dyslexia was. You know, we were just all these guys on spectrums, couldn't read. You know, my handwriting looks like a cat ran over the page and the ink was spilled. You know. But God takes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Amen. That which is not as though it were. That's what God does. You have to battle for fellowship, friends. You have to battle to open your Bible. You will not be able to have significant fellowship with God unless you hear his word. can't do it. You can't go up against the darknesses around you and confront them when you have no basis in his word, when you don't have the consolation, when you don't, when you don't garner the faith that comes out of it. And it is a fight to get into the word again. Amen. It's a real fight. I want to tell you, you know, we Christians, friends, it's not an easy life. It's an impossible life without the Holy Spirit. Because, but we sang to him this morning, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come. No, no, I want the Holy Spirit not just to pound my heart. I want him to move my life, amen. amen. Hallelujah. You have to battle to pray. You have to fight for prayer. You have to. How, if you can't hear his voice, if you don't hear him, if you don't pray, you're not going to hear him. If you don't wait in his presence. You're not going to know the consolation. And when the enemy comes, you won't be hearing from God. You'll be hearing at best from the flesh or the enemy. And it will disorientate you. It's a fight for fellowship. 
If you want to go up higher to Hebron, fellowship with God, our Bibles need to be opened again. Prayer needs to be something that's part of our life. Amen. It's not a prayer time, it's a prayer life. It, we're going to pray on Wednesday, but we mention always pray and not faint. That's why the baptism of the Holy Spirit is so important, so that when you're driving in your car, you can pray in your spirit unto the Lord. God puts something in those words that I don't have to know what, how powerful it is, other than to believe that it is powerful. Amen. Amen. I don't know how praying in the Spirit edifies myself, as Paul says, but it does, because it did it to the Apostle Paul, amen. And he was the greatest New Testament writer that we have. All the doctrine comes from him. And I want to tell you, friends, God is calling you and I to pray. God is calling us to communicate, to know his nearness. You have to battle for fellowship. You have to battle to get out of bed on a Sunday morning and get to church. If you want to go to Hebron and have fellowship with God, you cannot do it as an island on your own. You're part of a body. And if you start playing that sort of stupid game with your life, you're going to be like the 10 that missed out. You're going to live in a constant wilderness, die in a constant wilderness. Not just you, your pedigree after you will all be the same. You won't, you'll produce after your own kind. If you're watered down, you're going to produce watery children. You're going to give them no example. You're going to have no legacy. When you, when you die, your life will have no real consequence. Why? Because you didn't learn how to push in and fellowship with the body of Christ. That's what the Bible says. Forget, neglect not, forsake not the assembly of yourselves, as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another all the more as we see the day coming. And the day coming is not the elections, friends. <laughs> it's not November, okay? That's not the day. The day is when Christ comes back. Hallelujah. That's the day we are praying for. We pray for eternal values. Hallelujah. Battle for prayer. Battle for fellowship. And battle to keep your hand on the plow. Fight to keep your hand on plowing this world for Jesus Christ. For the souls of men and women. You have to. You want fellowship, true fellowship then you have to have what God has at heart. Whatever the Father wants, has in his heart must be in your heart. Hallelujah. Battle to know him. Philippians, he tells us, Paul, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings and being made conformed even to his death. He tells us in Hebrews, the writer, let us labor. That's another word for battle. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into the rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. This is not an easy life, friends, but it's the life that we're called to. Many of you are going to go on to college, and two of you are going to hold hands and pray together, and ten are going to go off and party. End up in a perpetual wilderness broken lives, broken relationships, broken families, because they won't press into what's higher. They won't climb what's higher. I pray that today for this church that will not be something that's spoken over your life. I pray that, oh, 12 out of 12 will start ascending the hill of the Lord. Amen. 12 out of 12 will start to apprehend that which you've been apprehended for, laying hold of the very purposes that God has created you to be, friends. You were created to contain the Creator. Amen. What an amazing thing in, in me. The, the fullness of the Godhead through the Holy Spirit how enters into my life, makes me a cooperative with God. I, I am in Christ, Christ is in me, and I become a partaker, as the Apostle Paul says, of the divine nature. That's not just the fact of being justified correctly and being made in right standing with God, but that is also the nature of salvation because he employs you and me to be the light of the world. It pleased the Father to reveal his Son through me and through you. This is God's plan. Now, if it was up to me, I would fire most of you and do a different plan. But look at the person next to you and say, this is God's plan. This is God's plan. We have to battle. We have to be ready to go up to Hebron. We have to embrace the call of a Christian life. Saul's greatest sin, in my opinion, outside of his, his lack of faith and, and his disobedience to the Lord is that he never embraced his call as king. He was irresponsible, hiding behind the baggage. 
you know, when he was meant to be anointed as king, you know, hiding away. And, you know, the time of shying away from being a Christian is over. You're either in or you're out. Amen. And if you're in, let's go to Hebron. Hallelujah. If you're in, let's press in. If you're in, let's open the word together again. Let's be men and women of the book. Let, when we talk, let, our, let our, the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable to the Lord but others. Let it be based out of a life of prayer, of sacrifice, of I investment in the word of God. That when we speak, our words don't fall to the floor. They're God-generated. They're weighty. They're words that touch the hearts and minds and lives and transforms people and nations. Amen. They're not your words or my words. The words... The world doesn't need a word from you. It needs a word from him through you. Amen. And that's why prayer, the word of God and fellowship are something that are indispensable for the Christian. Don't abandon meeting together. Fight for fellowship. And if you're living in Cork, you have to fight for a car park space. I don't know about here. <laughs> to me, I think it's very well laid on here. I think you guys are pretty spoiled. You come and join the city center church in the middle of the red light district and try to park your car. And then you find that there's no parking and you're paying $5 an hour. And you're hoping the pastor Nick is going to be a bit short that he doesn't, doesn't go into a third hour that morning. You have to fight. You have to fight. We don't, you know, our fight is a different fight now. You know, when, when you come to Christ, the veil of the temple is open. There's no prohibition from God towards you and towards me into entering his presence. The, the, the skies are open to us. We have an open heaven. We have an invitation. But with any invitation, you have to take it up. Amen. Amen. And so we battle, friends, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And most of us never have to fight the devil. Most of us, our issues are flesh. Unfortunately, most of us are of no danger to the enemy yet. There's still time. Still time. Still time to be a real threat to him. But we have to, first of all, b b the, the world, the flesh, and the devil, we have to battle through our own flesh. Rolling out of bed, presenting yourself on a Sunday morning. Don't forget your checkbook. <laughs> I'm not even into that because I think if God's got your heart, he's got your checkbook anyhow. You battle for fellowship you battle for unity you battle for the purposes of God but you do battle and he had to fight through all those darknesses the spiritual games vicious peoples he did it friends he embraced the call of God in his in his life and I believe that's what God is calling us to he's calling us back to if you think that the new covenant is licensed for laziness I want to tell you, because of a little folding of the hands, because of laziness, the house decays. If you and I start to pull back from the call of, going, of fellowship with God, fellowship with God is engagement in all these areas. You cannot move away from it. You cannot cut that out of your life, friends. You cannot reinvent it and try to work another way. That's what the other 10 try to do. They try to find another way to come into a promised land, another way to settle, so much so that some of the tribes, when it eventually got to settling, they didn't move in. Two tribes didn't move into the promised land. They stayed on the Moab side. They didn't want to cross over with the rest of them. They stayed on the Moab side. You know, they're, they're a type of people that overestimate their strength and underestimate their weaknesses. Because they were the first two tribes to fall when the Babylonians came in. They were on the plains of Moab, no protection. And when the enemy came in, the Assyrians came in, they came and they annexed them, they were gone straight away. Don't try to take the easy way out, friends. Go like Caleb knew and he said, I'm going to fellowship with God, but I have to fight through many enemies, but God is with me. I was a different spirit. He was wholehearted. He was singleness of vision. And he was 85 years old. If anybody had a right to hang up the gloves, it was him. If anybody had a right of an excuse not to push on, and it was him. But no, I'm as strong now as the day when Moses called us out. Oh, give me the hill country. Give me Hebron. Fellowship. Because I want fellowship with God. Oh, that I may know him. The power of his resurrection. The fellowship of his suffering. And that I may be conformed to his death. Oh, I think Caleb preached that verse long before Paul wrote it to us. He showed us this is what God would have for every believer.
The eyes of the Lord are to and fro this earth looking for whose heart is completely his. Singleness of heart. A heart for Hebron. A heart for fellowship. Fellowship with God. If you fellowship with God, you fellowship with the purposes of God. Oh, you just have this sort of a you know, nexus moment where you're just caught up in this spiritual sort of a dreamy world of experience. No, when you fellowship with God, you engage with God in the purposes of God. Amen. His heart becomes your heart. I said, his heart becomes your heart. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Singleness of heart. You know, 2,000 years later, there was another hill called Calvary where there was a wonderful man called Jesus the dear son of God had to fight against every demonic force in the garden of Gethsemane as he battled and every power of darkness and hell came against him to desist him from the plan and purposes of the father where he had to for the joy that was set before him Endure such hostilities against himself, even from the hands of sinners like us. Why? Because he wanted fellowship with you. He battled up that hill, carrying that cross, friends, enduring the scourging and the scoffing and the rage and every demonic activity around him, the zoom zoomers, the ghostly ones, everybody, everything taunting him as he carried that cross down the Vela Dolorosa as he went up to the place of the skull and as they nailed him to it, friends, he did it because he wanted fellowship with you and he wanted fellowship with me. He set his face as Isaiah tells us, like a flint. He became stony faced. There was nothing else. Nothing was going to move him. He rebuked Peter when he said, Lord, be it not so that you would not be killed in Jerusalem. And he said, get behind me, Satan. He knew this is why I was called. And you know why you're called. You're not called just for a fuzzy feeling. You're called to be soldiers to go to Hebron. You're going to go up that mountain. You're going to use prayer. You can use the word of God. You can use fellowship. And God's going to bless you. And you're going to conquer it. And you're going to have a story to tell in eternity. Amen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. When the books are closed. And when the scrolls are open, friends. And when they begin to read the annals of your life and your history. They will say, this is a man or a woman that has walked with God. Amen. This is a man or woman that has believed in God. This is a man or woman that fought the fight. Fought the fight. Kept the faith. Hallelujah. And now there's a crown waiting for them in glory. You know, it says at the end of that reading this morning that Hebron fellowship still belongs to the descendants of Caleb to this day. And because of what Christ did for you and me at Calvary, by going up that hill, fellowship, Hebron, is still your inheritance. That's your inheritance. Don't let, no, don't let your own flesh or the world or the devil keep you from your inheritance. Don't let the world, the flesh, which is the worst part, or the devil keep you from what Christ has won. Keep you back from apprehending all that God has apprehended for you in Christ. This is a Caleb generation. It has to be. God is calling out a Caleb. It doesn't matter what age group you fall into this morning. We've got a lot of energy and, and, and passion here but we've got a lot of experience here amen and the kingdom of God is something old and something new it's not all new and it's not all old it's come something old and something new they're going to need encouragement they're starting out in life they're going to need vision and energy because they're closing out in life but the two working together for fellowship for Hebron will go up against every darkness whether it's in the political system in the school system, whatever we come up against, friends, we fight together in the name of Jesus. We fight not against flesh and blood. We're not out there punching the lights out of people. We're not down burning down uh, Capitol Hill and rioting because we didn't get away like a pack of sour babies. No, no, friends. We do our fighting a different way. We fight in prayer. We open up the word of God. We get a word from God. We speak that word and demons flee. I said demons flee. God has put something in you so powerful, so amazing.
that if you would step into those purposes by faith, God will equip you. He will anoint you. You will be able to say, as Isaiah wrote, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. Hallelujah. This is an hour for you and for me to not be like the ten, the mealy-mouthed, watered-down ones that couldn't see the purposes of God. This is a time for you and me to be the Caleb's of our generation. When we see the darknesses around us, we have to say when sin abounds, then grace does much more abound. Amen. Oh, would you stand with me today? Come on. Let's just ask God to do something so real and tangible that the world will know that we've met with Christ this morning. Amen. Come on, church. Press in. We're going to do an altar call. We're going to hand over to Pastor Matt in a moment. But young people, you too. God has touched you this week. But you have to believe there's more. God is going to open up his word. I said, God is going to open up the purposes for your life. God is going to give you that hunger for prayer, for his presence. And men will know that you have been with Christ. And that's what's going to make a difference in this world. As we worship this morning, Pastor Matt's going to come. As we worship this morning, if you are that person, say, do you know what? I've been one of the 10 spies. I've been so dormant and I've been so way out there. But now I want to be a Caleb. I want to be wholehearted. I want to be of a different spirit. And I'm telling you, God will meet you. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what's right, for they shall be satisfied. God will energize you today. He will mark you to be different. And the end of your story is going to change this morning at this altar. Amen. Your story was different before you heard this. Some of your story was very different. Your end was, was not going to be a good end. It was going to be an end full of unbelief and dying in the wilderness. But I believe that God's called you to be a Caleb. Wholehearted. You give him what you have, whatever's left. And he'll bless it. And you'll go up that mountain of fellowship. And you'll be able to say, I've run the race. I fought the fight and I've kept the faith. Now there is a crown of glory awaiting for me. And that is not presumption, that's your inheritance.